Okay, so um, we are the what we call the tech cluster. We are here at the UI. I'll give a little bit of context for our guests to understand um, why we invited them here. So the UI has four, depart four departments uh, focused on social sciences, law, economics, political science, and history. So we don't have really hard scientists uh, in the European University Institute. We have... Um, research centers like the Schumann Center, the, which hosts uh, Florence School of Regulation. But we don't really have a lot of e experts permanently here that uh, have backgrounds in what we call hard science. So in a bid to uh, create a space for conversation across the social science and the hard sciences, the UI created a, a variety of, of clusters focused on in interdisciplinary work. And we in the tech cluster, we really like this idea of trying to engage with with people from the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. And so one problem we've encountered this past year is every time we speak about technology, people want to talk about digital. Um, and so we thought maybe it would make sense to uh, broaden our horizon and talk about technologies which are not necessarily related to digital. And as part of that, uh, at some point, it became clear that um, we wanted to get a little more informed about, um, about uh, nuclear power and, and energy technology. So we have a few units here in the UI which work on this, like the FSR. There's also a group in the SDG that does some climate related, climate policy related work. Uh, but so, you know, we thought, okay, why don't we take a cut at this with this uh, maybe distinctive angle of inviting people with a technical back, technical scientific engineering background. Okay, so I spoke about this with Leonardo when he was just appointed. And he said, oh, I know two people who will help you. Um, and the great thing is that um, they are both scientists, engineers, they can talk about nuclear, and I think they can bring complementary views and maybe even a little bit of disagreement for a good discussion. So I said, yeah, that's great, we want to do this. And uh, after a, a little bit of scheduling uh, difficulties, we managed to set this date for the event, which coincides with, I think, Germany closing its last three nuclear power plants in the weekend or something like this. So I was like, wow, actually the date made a lot of sense in terms of you know perfect timing. Um, so that's pretty good. So here we are today. Uh, we are joined by uh, two professors from the same university, uh, the Catholic University Leuven, uh, that I know very well because I discovered Belgium going through an Erasmus for one year in the law school at the KUL. And that was the beginning of my love stories with Belgium, which led me to acquire Belgian citizenship 15 years ago as a French. How often that happens, I don't know, but um, that's, uh, that is a good testimony of how much I really love uh, Belgium and Belgians. All right, so um, our two guests are, I'll introduce them in turn. Uh, the, our first speaker will be Professor Ronnie Bellmans. Um, Ronnie holds an um, MSc degree in electrical engineering and a PhD degree from the KU Leuven. Um, in his career as full professor at the university, so it's the techno-economical aspects of power systems, electrical energy and regulatory affairs, amongst other things. His research interest focuses on smart grid, security of energy supply, and other things related to the liberalization of energy markets. He's the founder and CEO of Energyville. Uh, he'll talk about this, I'm sure, as I saw from the slides. Uh, I don't know if this is still actual, Ronnie, but you can tell me if my biographical details are wrong, but you are or you were the chairman of the board of directors of the VREG, the Flemish regulator for electricity and gas markets, and honorary chairman of the board of directors of ELIA, uh, the um, Belgian transmission system operator. So that's uh, already um, an arm long biography, and uh, there's a wealth of expertise on this table. Um, that, is, um, that is also provided by our second guest, uh, Professor Dessalaire who's a full professor of, in the College of Engineering of the University of Leuven, KU Leuven again. Professor Dessalaire holds degrees in electromechanical engineering and nuclear engineering from the KU Leuven and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, as I understand from um, the information I have, you also spent some time in uh, the Belgian engineering consulting company, Tractable Engineering. And um, uh, you, you've, Following that uh, stint for three years, you um, became a, a full-time faculty member at the KU Leuven. 
Um, I've read that you are the chairman of Kogan Vlanderen, Flemish Association for the Promotion of High Quality Cogeneration, and chairman of the energy section of the Royal Flemish Engineering Association, and the president of the Belgian Nuclear Higher Education Network. So that's um, all I can say. I mean, and, you know, I don't know if these organizations, um, you know, mean a lot to the people that we used to have here at the cluster, but I can certainly testify by going through your resumes that uh, we have, you know, much more expertise maybe than we need. Uh, we are non-technical people. I mean, I don't consider myself to be a very technical person. Maybe Jaco, my um, colleague, was professor of economics in the, it's focused on industrial organization, understand what you're going to say, we'll understand what you're going to say much better than I do. But we're really interested in understanding the sort of, you know, economics and politics and regulatory and technical aspects that underpin this discussion around nuclear. It's, it's very hard from us from the outside to understand what's going on. We've seen a sort of ebb and flow of love and hate around nuclear these past 20 years. And uh, we hope that we can um, be more informed after your talk. So Rani, um, I give the floor to you immediately and we're all ears. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Nicola. Glad to be here. Um, I'm quite often here. I've spent some time with Jean-Michel Glachon slash uh, Leonardo Mears now and trying to bring also Betilaria and trying to bring some technical aspects to the discussion with uh, Alberto, Ilaria, James and Tutti Quanti uh, to say that we have that triangle correctly between regulatory legislation, economics, and technical. Because we can do an awful lot of mistakes if we ignore the laws that govern the different things. Okay, let's go ahead. And it says nuclear in a renewable energy. Ah, close, close that one. Okay. How to have nuclear energy in a future Renewable energy dominated power system, because let's be frank and fair, nuclear is there, will be there, but the real bulk of the electric energy will be delivered by renewables. And the question is, what task can renewable do in a, what can task can nuclear do if we have a system which is dominated by renewables and a system which has to be sustainable, which has to be CO2 neutral, uh, greenhouse gas free. In order to understand a lot of the debate which is on today, I thought it was a good idea to go back in time and show you what nuclear did, how nuclear was brought into the system, why nuclear was brought into the system, and why it is where it is now. A lot of people will talk to you about baseload power plants. And baseload power plants are power plants which run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and offer an almost constant output. This is very important, that constant output. If you go to nuclear, nuclear loves to do that. Nuclear loves to live with a very high load factor. Constant load is a lot of investments and things which have a lot of investments and not a high uh, OPEX, not a high operational cost, love to operate constantly. Of course, the load is not constant. So there have to be peak loads, there have to be peak power plants that cover that load. Maybe for the audience, the electrical system is a very interesting one. The load, the demand has at every instant in time be matched by the generation, by the supply. This is a very weird market. There are no potatoes on the shelf that can be used tomorrow. We have batteries, we have things to do that today, but as such, it is an instant uh, balance. Peaks can be shaved. Renewables were used to a certain extent 
And bomb storage, very easy thing, a lot available for those who are Italian amongst the audience in the north of Italy, where you pump up water up the mountain and let the water go down where there's a peak demand. Here you see a picture of nuclear power plants. This is the nuclear power plant of Tihange in Belgium. We have two groups of nuclear power plants, one at the river Meuse in the south of the country, one at the river Schelde near to Antwerp, a uh, duel in the north of the country. And what's important, and what's a very specific and very important feature of nuclear power, on this picture, you see roughly 25% of the electricity production in Belgium. The footprint of nuclear is extremely small, which is a very interesting feature, certainly in a NIMBY time where people are complaining about uh, wind turbines, PV filling hectares, etc., etc. Never forget, nuclear is a source which is very compact. That's why I put this picture in. But if you have any power plants, you need a grid to bring the power to the people, not citing John Lennon here, because it was a time when I was young, power to the people, but it has nothing to do with this thing. But here you see the high voltage grid, which was developed amongst others to bring the nuclear power to the customer. And that grid was built in the 60s and 70s. So with nuclear power came a very high voltage grid to supply at longer distance the demand. And I took deliberately this map because it still says UCTE, something which has disappeared and it's now part of ENSOE. This may be something that you are better known of, which is a new thing. Where is the nuclear power these days? I took the picture from uh, Eurostat, and you see there are countries in Europe which use, in the EU27, which do use nuclear, others which don't. In the meanwhile, Germany, that circle has gone. Okay, you see Finland has grown a bit. Yesterday there was uh, Oike Lotto was finally onto the grid, has been built during 16 years. Sweden has nuclear power. Belgium has shut down two out, out of seven. There's one very small one in Holland. And of course, the biggest elephant in the room is France, where they have a lot of nuclear power, which has also its challenges. Energy only market has been debated lately very much in detail, has been questioned with the high prices last year. But how is it going to move? What is going to happen? On the left-hand side, you see the energy-only market. When it was founded, say, around 2000, you had the base load with a marginal price of nuclear power being roughly 14 to 15 euro per megawatt hour. You had mid load, which was coal, 40, 50 euro per megawatt hour. Also the 40, 50 euro per megawatt hour for gas fire power plants, two times the gas price. And then you have the peak load. And you have the smoothest supply curve. And then you have the demand. And where the demand, low or high demand, crosses the supply curve, that's where the market closes. What happens when you introduce renewable on the right-hand side? You see that whole stuff going to the right, and you see the peak loads being out of service, mid loads getting out of service. And if you even put more renewable in it, you will see that the demand, part of the base load may be out of service. This is a challenge for the nuclear who want to operate constantly. Now here you see what was happening in the good old days. Ladies and gentlemen, very simple. You switch on the light at your home and a power plant had to react to produce more power. Demand sets generation. Okay. Uh, 
There has to be put some more gas into a gas-fired power plant. So there is that equilibrium again between demand and supply. This was very interesting. Demand could do whatever it wanted to do. Generation had to follow. But even then, we had already some problems or challenges. In Belgium, where we have seven nuclear power plants, and we had a demand which was sometimes lower during the night than what the nuclear power plants could deliver and they wanted to operate constantly. So we gave price signals, a lower price for the electricity during the night to push people to consume electricity during the night. For instance, washing machine, etc. So even with the non-flexible generation being nuclear, we got already demand side management. And we'll see that later. If you get more and more non-flexible generation, generation that you cannot change, being renewables, you need more demand side management to get that equilibrium. So in that respect, renewables really are quite similar to nuclear. They cannot be controlled or are difficult to control in their output. You can curtail them, etc. Also, what you see here is that demand set generation, but also you see this single-sided flow from the power plant to all the demand. So there is no the flow is very unilateral. This is how it was. And sometimes you hear in debates, people still using those old terms. This is wrong. The system of the future will be totally different. And rather than trying to discuss in abstract terms, I took the liberty when setting up these slides to go to the site of Elia. And with the liberalization, you find an enormous amount, amount of data on the website on grid operators. This is real data, really available. And you see the date when I use, when I put my slides together. Okay. You see that there was three out of the you know, four infected, it's two, one, two, two, uh, 1600 plus, uh, Roughly two, three and the other two are already out. And I think that one of the, the small ones were out. You see the base load, the yellow bit at the bottom, which is nuclear power. And then you see the load following by natural gas. You see some others burning of wood, etc. There is no coal in Belgium. Belgium was the first country in 2016 that shut down all cold fire power plants. It's the only country in Europe until now which had coal that has closed all coal fired power plants. By the way, this was not a decision by the government. It was a purely industrial decision. And a lot of countries are waving political statements that they would close all coal fired power plants and don't do it. We did it, but we don't have to thank our government. Okay, that's typical for Belgium. We do things despite of governments. This is not for the notes. You see also the uh, top part, which is says water. Water is in fact uh, pumped hydro. So uh, now the second part is. And that's what I took also. Again, is the same unit. You see 2,500 megawatt of, there is five gigawatt of wind offshore and onshore in Belgium, roughly. And you see during that day, wind went up to roughly 2,500 megawatt. And what you also see is that there is a difference between it was the day before, I took that curve the day before, there's a difference between prediction, the green curve, and the orange curve, the actual generation. 
So there you see a very major challenge. It's not that unchangeable constant thing, which is a nuclear power plant. It's not fatal as nuclear power plant being constant. William will tell you it's not that fatal. It can be changed. Wind is fatal. It can also be changed. You can curtail. You cannot bring it up. But yes, the wind predictions are very well these days, but they're not perfect. Het volgende erbij nu. Als een aantal. Het volgende erbij nu. Here you see the double impact, where there is that minimum load, and you see with must runs, you can get negative prices. Zien dat ze er zouden uitvliegen, of dat ze niet kunnen gaan regelen en dat de opstart en topkosten veel te hoog zijn. En dan nog het nieuwbare, dan zie je dat er nog heel weinig mensen in de boterham kunnen verdienen. Dus zeker en vast, door die het nieuwbare, zijn er dat het centraal was met een hoge. Marginale kosten. Nou, je moet niet, hè? Nou ja, dat is niet Heel veel. It's fine for me, but that's uh, maybe less interesting for the audience or more interesting for the audience. Good. I think we can, we can. Okay. So what you see is that you have must run and you have renewables which can go to negative prices. What can, a very easy explanation for negative prices on renewables is when they get subsidies. If you get 80 euro per megawatt hour that you produce a subsidy, and you have to pay 40 euro to deliver it, you still have 40 euro in your pocket. So you can live with negative prices. Sometimes if you need to shut down a coal-fired power plant, it costs an awful lot to restart it. And that's why you get to negative prices. Oops. Unbalances, the change, the difference between that green and orange, the same holes for PV, and the demand, which is also non-predictable. You see that there are a lot of unbalances on the grid between supply and demand. And those unbalances have to be covered by somebody, by very fast peak power plants, which cost an awful lot. That's also a market and unbalances cost an awful lot. So you better predict your PV and your wind output correctly the day before. And that's why an awful lot of money is earned these days by weather forecasts. In the good old days, weather forecasts were important for tourism, but these days it's much more important for energy. And in the future system, you will see that in this, in this way, oops, where is that move? Why is that movie not working? Yeah, I mean, it's just here it is. Okay, uh, here you see how the wind and sun are in working and bringing in the energy. And you see that that overall thing is not constant anymore. And you have the overall solution with PV, with wind, with demand side being available. Now, if we are doing that, you see that that system is totally different with storage and with batteries in the whole thing. We had a grid before, which was built for covering the flow by gas-fired power plants, coal-fired power plants, hydro, and nuclear. But here you see the real challenge for the future. In red, you see Italy, Greece, Balkan, Turkey, Spain, with a lot of PV. A lot of hydro also. And you see the green part where there is a lot of wind. The demand is not coherent with that. And we need a new grid. We are talking these days, just to give you some figures, 
about 300 gigawatt of wind in the North Sea. 300 gigawatt. The peak demand of Belgium is 15 gigawatt. So we're talking about a capacity which is 20 times Belgium. Or if I, if I take the Benelux, which is roughly 40 gigawatt. So if we have 300 divided by 40, we have 7.5 times the demand, the peak demand, the peak demand of the Benelux. And most of that wind energy will enter Europe via the Netherlands and Belgium. Look at the map. So we need a grid to bring that 300 gigawatt to Germany, Switzerland, Czechia, Poland, France, and further on. We need a new grid on top of the present one. And ladies and gentlemen, nuclear is part of that game and can be there. But nuclear is going to live in a totally different surrounding. And I hope that I showed you that very much in detail. Give you a few things to finalize and I have my 20 minutes of fame. We did some scenario thinking by Energyville. Uh, I'm officially retired, but I still challenge them every day. And we tried to model for Belgium how a system could look, energy system could look by 2050 being totally CO2 neutral. We have a central system with where we say the industrial output is the same. We have a potential of 100 gigawatt of rooftop PV, maximum 20 gigawatt onshore wind, maximum 8 gigawatt offshore wind. And then we say we have an, a variation on that, the same thing, but we go deeper into the sea and tap in another 16 gigawatt of, of offshore wind. And we allow with a certain price, small modular reactors by 2045. William will come to that later. Or another variation if is that we have clean molecules, Ilaria, very close to your heart. And we suppose that there are 1.7 euro per kilogram hydrogen. And see what happens. What is the most societal lowest cost system that comes out of it? And here you see the results. Okay. The left one is the central, then you have mortification with the nuclear and the deep offshore wind and the molecules imported. What comes out of it is a system with far more capacity. Okay, By 2030, four times more PV in Belgium. By 2030, two times more offshore and onshore wind. By 2050, there will be some green molecules, but certainly, if you want to go to a minimum societal cost, you end up with, if they are there, uh, Ilaria, you can take pictures as much as you like, but I think that uh, Nicolas will send the slides around and I have more of them. So with a good with a good cup of coffee, you get even more. Okay. So, so you have 16 gigawatt of offshore wind, deep offshore wind, and six gigawatt base nuclear. That's the most optimal thing. Very much needed is demand flexibility. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Also, the flexibility in the energy system is a big need for batteries, will be in the system. And there is some production of hydrogen that can also serve as balance. So, dear audience, can nuclear be part of the future? Yes, but we'll have come to that later. But that future is not the nuclear that we have seen. The base load nuclear, which we had and delivered together with varying gas and varying coal, the supply to the demand, which was free to handle, is going to be gone we will have a massive amount of renewables. And in that massive amount of renewables, which are fatal, 
which are non-compressible, which are difficult to handle, how to work with nuclear, which also loves to, to run constantly. That's the debate which has to be found and how that investments will go if you don't have to operate 8,760 hours per year. That's a totally different ball game. The same technology will need to be operated in a totally different way. And that's the most important message I want to pass. Thank you very much. So we'll keep the applause for after. Okay. And I think it's, uh, it's better probably to hand over immediately to, to William. So thanks a lot for this. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ronnie. Uh, just a few comments before I start, because your, uh, um, the resume that you gave is, is a bit dated. Uh, and I think it's relevant to, to add a few things. Um, um, the chair on which I was appointed, if I may say so, that was actually called energy systems and energy efficiency. So that's basically what my chair in Leuven was at that time. And that's most of what I've been doing. So energy systems, but without excluding any technology, a priori, including nuclear. Okay, and then I also had in detail some expertise and been teaching in, in nuclear. Um, I'm also the chair at this moment still of the scientific committee of the Belgian nuclear regulator. Okay, and it's an almost binding advice that we give. So whenever there is a new uh, a new uh, license to be given, uh, that that's a very important thing. So that's my regulatory side a little bit. I'm the chair of the working party on nuclear economics uh, for the NEA, and that's the economics part then uh, that I'm I'm interested in. Okay, then there are some other things, but that's less relevant. All right. Um, now I am going to start my uh, discussion of the, the overview a little bit with um, some relevant uh, references and then some preliminaries. Um, now, I always, I, I would be a bad consultant because I always give my my references that where I get my knowledge from and a consultant basically never does that. If you don't have much time to read on nuclear and if you want to have a relatively neutral comprehensive point of view on nuclear, these are the two documents that I would recommend. They're both by the IEA. The first one on the left was written in 2019. The second one on the right-hand side is, uh, um, was in June 2022, which means after uh, Putin's attack on Ukraine. Okay, And of course, then they're always the updated on an annual basis, the IEA World Energy Outlooks. Okay? Then some other things, there's a study there by MIT on the left-hand side, and this is by the IEA and NEA, the projected cost of generating electricity. It also gains quite a bit of information, especially the second part, where they give you uh, many explanations of what is going on. Then what I did here is on the left-hand side, this is something, the state of affairs of nuclear at this moment. That's from the World Nuclear Association, which is kind of a quote-unquote an industrial lobby group. To counterbalance that, I've added here the one by Michael uh, Schneider, which is then, uh, these are a group of people who are very much opposed to nuclear. Okay, and so when you read the two documents, you will see that one will give a somewhat different picture than the others, okay? Um, this is a little bit if you uh, want to know a little bit more about the future. These are the certain dreams that some people have about what the future might look like. You take it for whatever it's worth, okay? Um, then some interesting basic documents, because we will discuss about that long-term operation. What is the lifetime of a nuclear power plant? And then also the whole concept of load following. Uh, Ronnie also mentioned it a little bit. These are some docu uh, technical documents that give you some further explanation. Uh, and then on SMRs, I've only taken a small selection. There are tons of documents that are lying around, but a very interesting one is the one on the complete left side. That's um, a publication every year by the International Atomic Energy Agency, so a branch of the United Nations, where they basically give a short overview of all the different um, SMR um, types uh, or concepts. So they're about 83 at this moment. The, the second one is also interesting. That's by the NEA, and that's a dashboard. They intend to publish that every three to six months to update the whole thing, so to see how much... Have they advanced? Have they lifted to the promises, et cetera, and these things? You want to have some more details, that's what you see 
on the right hand side. And then sometimes you have to think also about external costs when you're talking about nuclear. On the left hand side, that's a document that is written relatively comprehensively by the Joint Research Center of the EU. On the right hand side, that's more on the cost of um, system integration of the living together of nuclear and, um, and renewables. Now, first, some preliminaries. Um, uh, when I was when I was discussing this, I was actually thinking, look, these other, our audience are not going to be engineers. And I know that we bombard you with lots of terminologies that we consider as daily things. And I have to admit that sometimes I listen to podcasts, even with physicists or um, engineers who are not experts in energy engineering, they sometimes say quite strange things. And so that's why I said it's better first to define a few things, to make things clear, certainly for people who don't have a technical background, okay? And I don't want to say anything with that, but if you talk about law, I also um, would appreciate if you first tell me the, real, the rules of the game and then I can try to follow. So the first thing that I thought is what is baseload? You have heard that Ronnie was talking about baseload. And I still have discussions now with some colleagues of mine uh, who still claim that in the near in the in the future that we still will need baseload? Now, okay, let's then just look at that. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that the concept of baseload at this moment has three distinct meanings, and that's very important. The first one is the one that Ronnie has been playing with, and that's the original meaning, and that's basically based on gradually filling up the load duration diagram. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the load duration diagram, but let me just summarize. What Ronnie showed you there was the chronological electricity demand for one day. Now you can do that for a whole year, okay? Uh, and that's what is typically done. If you now rank the instantaneous power that is needed, and let me just take one step back, and maybe I'm overdoing this, and if I'm overdoing that, just tell me that. Now, Ronnie talked about capacity in megawatts. Now, capacity, that's the amount that the machine in the best circumstances can deliver. So a wind turbine of one megawatt has a capacity of one megawatt installed capacity. If the wind blows like hell, it will produce one megawatt. A nuclear power plant of a thousand megawatts, if it's running, it's running fine, it can produce a thousand megawatts. But when it is under maintenance, it produces zero, right? So there's a difference between the installed capacity, as it's called. We sometimes call it the installed power capacity and the instantaneous power delivery, okay? So the, the instantaneous power delivery, that's the water that comes, the flow rate that comes out of the fossil. That's basically what the power delivery is. Then you have megawatt hours. That is effectively what is then done over a duration over a whole year. And then sometimes that in order to complete, complete you, uh, shake you up, that is there is even something megawatt per hour. Now megawatt per hour has to do with the rate at which a power plant can increase or decrease. Okay, so it's the, the, how, how quickly can you change the volume that comes out of the faucet? That's basically what it is. Now what I'm doing here is then I take that chronological electricity pattern that Ronnie had, and I'm going to rank it with the, the instantaneous power from the, the duration. And you see on the left-hand side, that's what you see there. Is there a, a pointer here? Yeah. On the left-hand side, that is, then you see that that's the peak power. It only appears for a few minutes. And that indeed then is then ranked. And you see then at the right-hand side that there is still a certain amount that is basically 8,760 hours a year. And that's what usually was filled up by what they call baseload, okay? Uh, right, that is uh, what you do in that case. Um, these continuously operating power plants, these were then the so-called baseload plants, but now we have to be careful. These so-called baseload power plants, they deliver an electrical output to the grid. That's what they do. And they run that consta constantly. It's sometimes referred to as continuous full rated electrical output. So there is even abbreviation for their REO. Okay, uh, it will become clear why I'm saying now that. Now you even have to make it a bit more specific. You have to say, 
It should be full rated electrical output, but injected into the grid. That's what we mean here. Okay. Now that's the original meaning. Now in the future world, and we're thinking now that might differ from country to country. In some countries, we're already there to some extent, in others not. But in the future year, uh, world, let's say 10, 20, 30 years from now, the future world will be determined, will be, um, yeah, the rule of the game will be massive amounts of variable renewable installed capacity. As Ronnie said, sometimes up to four or five times the capacity of a particular country. Sorry, the demand, the peak demand of a, of a country. So the classical baseload generation, does it still make sense? And the answer is probably not. Why? Well, the variable renewable ones, when and some, they have a zero marginal cost. So they're the cheapest, whatever you like it. Okay, now nuclear has a non-zero marginal cost. So um, what will happen is that when you look at the instantaneous, when the instantaneous uh, solar and wind power is bigger than the total load of the demand, okay, then you're going to run what Ronnie said and the negative prices. Well, at least the other plants, they will have to react. They will be pushed out of the system, including nuclear. Um, now, subject to the constraints, and this has to do with, uh, can you um, slow down the power plant and, and shut it down for one day and then start it back up? So that's what they mean in the uh, cold and hot uh, startup. So there are some technical constraints, but in principle, nuclear will also react, okay? Now, why? Well, simply economics will dictate that, okay? If other things are cheaper, that nuclear will run because the price will be close to zero at that time and the price will, uh, so they will run at the uh, at the, at the, at the loss. Or, and that's what for instance happens in Germany that the regulator required load following. So the regulator there dictated and said, you have to follow the load. Now I have here a caveat and that's that in realistic markets, you have sometimes strategic behavior of nuclear operators that they say, well, yeah, but we don't want to lower our things, even if we have to run with a little bit of loss for a few hours, but we don't allow the others to come into the system. Um, Ronnie has mentioned if you have subsidies per megawatt hour, that indeed, and if you have negative prices, that it's still profitable to, to, to offer your, um, your, your renewable power because you're still being paid for it. Um, or, and that's another interesting thing, if you have a very big gen uh, generation company, a big utility, let's say, that owns and nuclear power plants and a lot of wind and solar. Because then they have uh, their own portfolio, they have to decide and balance for themselves, what do they want to choose? And of course, then I think in that case, it will be the rule of the game of the economics. Now, it will be different the situation uh, in time, and depending on the countries, when you have a share on, in energy terms on an annual basis, well, it will be 40 years, 40%, 60%, 80, 80 plus, whatever. So it will be over the next 10, 20, 30 years and will be different from country to country. That is pr pretty clear. Okay. Now, the conclusion of what we've just said is that that full, um, what was it where I don't know always the, the, the real, that was it, uh, that is then that you rated uh, electricity output injected to the grid is no longer required. It's not even desired. Now, but some people that sometimes say, yeah, but wait, that's later because industry, they want, they have sometimes electric power demand in the process industries 24 seven. So we want to have electrical power all the time. And isn't that then base load? Well, it depends on how you define it. But as a matter of fact, these industries, they do require this continuous thing, but they don't care where the electrons come from. The electrons are not colored. They just say, we need a certain amount of electrical power constant, but where it comes from, that's not our problem. Okay, they want to have a guaranteed delivery. Okay, and that's a contractual agreement then with their supplier. Another interesting caveat there is, for instance, if you take now the one that Ronnie talked about, Okliotto 3, which is owned by TVO, which is in a group of several big industrial 
companies, uh, manufacturing companies, they own the power plant. They have a contract with that power plant. What they are going to do? Are they going to just buy the electrons or accept the electrons of their power plant? Or are they just going to say, well, if there's something cheaper on the market, we just take something cheaper. So that's an interesting study case again. And then the third thing is that for the economics, nuclear power plants or nuclear operators, they prefer to keep producing at a constant output. That's what they would want to do. Now, okay, but there's a difference between feeding constant electricity power into the grid and keeping your reactor running, the chain reactor running at a constant level. That's a different thing because you can always deconnect yourself from the grid. If you deconnect them yourself from the generator, you're still producing heat, but you're not delivering necessary to the grid. That's another way of calling that um, uh, baseload. So that is what they call keep the reactor thermal output constant, but not necessarily generating electricity. Sometimes that's referred to as steady full rated thermal power, RTP. Okay. So then, of course, that means that you will have to utilize or they will have to utilize that heat as an alternative valuable product and sell that one way or another, for instance, for desalination, cogeneration, feeding it into, for instance, district heating, uh, or assist electrolysis to make hydrogen, but do that then at higher temperatures, which is more efficient, uh, efficiently. Uh, you may also look at high temperature heat storage uh, with so-called uh, fire bricks or molten salts. And this is a very interesting idea that is floating around using the same technology as the concentrated solar power plants right? because they store their, uh, their heat, their very hot temperatures. When the sun is shining, they sometimes store them in California and, and Nevada, for instance, uh, in uh, molten salt. And then the nuclear guys say, well, we can do something similar. We'll see. Okay. Or you can produce electric power anyway but not injected into the grid. So in that case, you just disconnect it before you go to the transformer, okay? And then you're going to, if suppose that electrical storage is steep, then of course, then these folks with the nuclear power plants can say, okay, we're not going to deliver it to the grid, but you're just going to store it in batteries or whatever thing, okay? And uh, fly, uh, flow batteries, um, but that depends clearly on the operational details. Uh, and again, the competition with cheap, VRE, because if indeed then the electricity coming from the renewables is much cheaper, uh, why do you then really want to keep your own nuclear power plant running anyway? So, but these are things that then an operator um, themselves that they will have to, uh, to figure out. Or you can use your produced electricity for electrolysis to produce hydrogen. That's another thing. That's why the nuclear folks seem to be also in favor of hydrogen as an alternative project, uh, product. So, the question then is, is this, so that's another way of defining base load. So that's thermal base load, but not necessarily injecting it into the grid. But of course, that means that they will have to do something useful with their other products. However, nuclear power plants do not necessarily have to run on base load. They can run in a non-continuous mode. And that's the next thing that I would like to discuss. So are nuclear power plants capable of load following? Because it's always said, no, nuclear power plants, they have to run constantly. It's not true. Let's look at, well, first of all, nuclear power plants can participate in load following. For instance, the German and the French nuclear power plants, they were designed to participate in load following. And if you don't believe it, here are two examples. The left-hand side is from Germany. And it's already, I think, from 2009 or something like that. And the right-hand side, that's from France. So they can if, they're, if they want to and if they're forced to. If you want to know a little bit more about the cost, there's another reference there on the right-hand side. Now, OK, this is then what you have. But the owners, the operators, don't always like to do that. And sometimes they hide behind the concept of baseload operation that they say, well, we can't run a baseload, we can't run a load following. Well, I'm not sure whether I believe them, okay? Now for safe load following, even if it's not designed to do so, 
you need to, they need to do, and that's the Belgian case, for instance, they were not originally designed, but if the Belgian nuclear operators would like to, or would be forced to run in uh, a load following mode, they should do first some studies, maybe implement some refurbishment, but in any case, uh, and have different procedures, but they need approval from the nuclear regulator, okay? I don't see any fundamental reason why they would not get the permission, but they will have to do the studies and the work, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's not like that, but it will take some preparation. Now, after the nuclear uh, regulatory go ahead, actual load following may, and that's again, this, the other thing, uh, depend on the nuclear electricity market, right? then now we're talking about the market regulators who may then force them to do load following. Um, or whether the nuclear power plants are uh, also own uh, large utility scale wind and solar farms. It's again that internal conflict within a company. And yeah, I think they're, they will do whatever suits them best in that case. This is an interesting picture that I found in that reference, um, just to show how about the, um, the aging of the whole thing. Um, here you have, uh, on the left hand on the left hand side, I think it's the uh, da, 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 I can't even read my own slides here. That's, oh, okay, thanks. So it's the equivalent forced outage rate. Okay, so that's indeed then. Um, so if that's high, that's not very good. So in the beginning, you have there some startup problems, and then as a number of years, you go to a minimum, and that's the dark blue curve there. Okay. Um, so if you uh, run that machine on base load, so as just electricity base load, always constantly, then the aging um, has indeed a gradually increasing uh, outage rate, okay? So it, it has some kind of an effect because of it is becoming older, okay? That's a normal thing. If you start now at a particular moment at the red line, the dashed line, if you start load following and you don't do anything you don't do any refurbishment, any studies or whatever, then you have the um, the red dotted line. So it's becoming much worse, much more aging, and that's not very good. You can do that intermittently, that from time to time you do some, um, after a few years you do some readjustments and that's then the, the, the jagged line. If on the other hand, if you do that on a regular basis, when your uh, plant, was uh, when you do once the refurbishment, I think that's then the green dotted line that you have there. The yellow line, that's I think the one if uh, it was actually designed to do load following. Okay, so you see technically in principle, it's perfectly possible. Now, just for completeness, uh, there are some slides here uh, that are in hidden uh, slide mode. So if you want to read more about them, please uh, be my guest, but I'm not going to deal with that. What is the levelized cost of electricity? This is very often that there are discussions about that. Now, the best way to look at that is that the levelized cost of electricity, it is a cost, but it's computed basically to have a break even between cost and revenues. So the best way to look at it as a non-technical person is, it's the, and you have an electric, electricity power generating unit. It's the fictitious average electricity price during its operation hours that it has to see over the lifetime of the plan to make all the cost break even. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it, uh, it only works with a constant price. No, it is the average fictitious price that you will have to see in order to run break even. And in, order, in other words, that's then to some extent a cost. It's dependent on, that's the formula if you want to look at that, and there you recognize clearly the net present value formula. Uh, it depends on a whole bunch of things. The most important things are discount rate, so the interest rate, that's a very important thing for your investment. And the second thing is important, that's the capacity factor. So how many hours per year can you run to some extent? And this has been published, it's being used by many, many groups, as you can see there, the left is for the renewables, the middle is for a whole bunch of things. And then uh, that Lazar is also typically known for that whole thing. Now the middle curve there uh, um, in the different colors, that's an interesting one because that gives you an idea of what for the same parameters, what the levelized cost of electricity of a particular power plant is, whatever it is, 
okay, for a reduced, uh, if you reduce the, um, if you move to the left-hand side uh, for a reduced capacity factor, and you see that indeed, if you design your plant for a capacity factor of 85, 90%, if you only run, let's say 40%, that becomes more costly. Okay. Maybe just a clarification. Mm -hmm. What do you mean exactly for a capacity factor? Oh, capacity factor is um, if you if your power plant runs a whole year, then the capacity factor is 100%. If it only runs, let's say, one month, and then it shut down for 11 months, then the capacity factor will be 112. Okay, so the capacity factor in Europe for solar power is roughly on the on the between 10 and 20 percent, roughly speaking. For wind offshore these days, it getting towards 35, 40, 50 percent in the better places now. So that is actually doing very well. Nuclear power plants they like to run very long, but of course if they're forced to reduce, then of course they will end up with a capacity factor of 40, 50 percent which of course increases, they, they can't earn their money back as quickly as possible. So that's that's why it's important to look at that. So essentially this is the denominator in the formula. Exactly. Sure it well, it's the, it's yeah, in, indeed. It, it's it's basically, it's hidden in the megawatt hour right. uh, every, every year, the megawatt right. hours that is produced every year. That's correct, yeah. But indeed, in as you actually look at this, you don't have to look at, or it's actually not all too honest to look only at the levelized cost of electricity of one particular technology, whatever it is, you have to look at the system cost. And there's where you have then the system LCOE or the value adjusted LCOE. I have to say, there's still a lot of discussions about that in the economics literature. Um, people are still trying to clar uh, clarify that. Um, and I try to follow the discussions, to be honest. Okay. If somebody wants to, yes. would be so kind to give me a bit of water. Of course. Thanks. Okay. Now, two things that are important in the current discussion, that's three and four. That is three, what I call long-term operation. That's, okay, you have existing plants in a system. What do you want to do with that? This gives you a little bit of an overview. It's a historical overview of uh, over the years, these are the um, number of plants that when they were started, the construction was started. These are the vertical bars. And the uh, other thing, that's then the um, installed power capacity uh, in the world, in the OECD and the non-OECD as a function of time. Here you see that worldwide, that um, yeah, we already have a few plants older than 40 years. There are even some plants older than 50 years, it seems. Um, and you see on the left-hand side in red that the most recent plants mostly come from China and India. Now, first, something that we have to clear up, and there's a lot of confusion in the literature and also in the press, what is the lifetime of a nuclear power plant? And also there, it's not all that clear. Now, first of all, you have to recognize a system does not have an a priori lifetime. It's not because the switch, your electrical switch is broken that you just tear down your building, right? Components and the nuclear field, they have to be qualified. So they're not just there, they, but they, they have a finite uh, lifetime. But of course, you can in principle replace all the components. And I'm talking about valves, switches, motors, pumps, steam generators, turbines, alternators, transformers, they can be replaced and they are being replaced, okay? Now the plant architecture and the layout may also become somewhat dated, but as such, it's not necessarily a reason to shut it down. As long as it still functions properly, why not? In most power plants that become of age, the instrumentation and control, they have been upgraded and replaced. Okay, so the controls are perfect. But there are some components, certainly one, that cannot really be replaced. It is possible in theory, but in practice it is not. And that's the reactor vessel, okay? 
it's too difficult or it's too expensive, whatever. So you could say that the technical lifetime is determined by the lifetime of the reactor vessel. It's informed uh, now the way, how do you know that? Well, what they basically do is they put in certain steel uh, samples, they put them closer to the interior of the uh, reactor core so that they're much more irradiated with neutrons and they can predict about 10, 15 years in advance what the brittleness of the, of the wall of the reactor vessel are going to be, okay? So that's the idea that they, that they use. So they know pretty much very well what uh, this thing is going to be. So, but please, when I say that everything can be replaced, safety should never ever be compromised, okay? And nuclear regulators should define a non-negotiable safety level and a non-safe plant must be shut down yesterday. Okay, so safety has to be correct. Now, sometimes people talk about the design life and indeed all plants have a design life. Now, what is it you have to look at that and these engineers, they sit on, on the table, these days it's a computer and they have to figure out how thick are the pipes going to be? How many pumps do we need? Do we need two pumps or three in order to have some backup, et cetera, and these things. So they, when they design, design things, they assume a certain, a certain number of standard transients because it's especially the thermal fatigue and the forces that are going to work that they are going to assume. They say, okay, we designed for 40 or for 60 years. We seem so many, um, so many um, transients. And so then we are going to design our machine, our reactor for, for that type of these parameters. So the pipes need to be that thick, that long and whatever. Now, also something important that is that these designs are made by the state-of-the-art computational methods. Now, when we go back to the 60s and the 70s, these were the days when computers were getting started, okay? And of course, in those days, nuclear power plants were designed also, bridges were designed in those days. Now, what do people in civil engineering do when they design a bridge? They know that they have rough methods, and then they use what they call an uncertainty factor. They say multiply by a factor of four. That we're sure that that's the same thing and between two and four. I'm simplifying, but that's a bit the way that, that it goes. Uh, so if you the, the more uncertain your method is, the bigger you consider your, your, your so-called safety factor in some sense. Okay. Now, um, Okay, the thickness and the manufacturing of the steel reactor is based on the assumed flux during a number of years, it's called the fluence. But now the thing is that during operation, what happens is that the actual transients that take place are counted. And the operational procedures are adjusted in order to mitigate the transients. So in other words, these original assumptions were no longer are mitigated. So actually they know that they have many more transients they can do than they originally anticipated in normal circumstances, okay? So, and after 30 to 40 years, when you do then the calculations these days with finite element methods, with computers, sophisticated computers, etc., it's much more accurate, which means that you can reduce your uncertainty factors. And that's why it is possible to indeed then um, have a longer operational line. And why the design life was a first estimate, but it's not the determining factor. Um, Okay, the reactor vessel is still there. Okay, with then its, its samples that we have there. Oops, sorry. So the design life is not the determining factor for the actual lifetime of a nuclear power plant. Now, sometimes you say, ah, but the license time. Aha, and since so the lawyers in the, in the room uh, or, or online. Um, but some countries have a predetermined uh, period that the license is valid. The typical example is the United States. There, all nuclear power plants originally are, uh, have a license for 40 years. It means after 40 years, it's, it's over, unless they prepare a file, a document, and they uh, submit that to the nuclear regulator for review in order to do certain upgrades, in order to get a new license. And that's what indeed then has happened. 
that many plants in the US have granted a lifetime a license now for 60 years. And I think there are two now who have even received one for 80 years. That's as far as the license is concerned. Now, France and Belgium, at least Belgium until 2003, they do not have a particular license lifetime. We have, or have, uh, what is called the uh, uh, Révision Décennale, the major overhauls after every 10 years, that they basically loosen every screw and they, they, they take the whole thing apart. They, it's a really a major uh, undertaking. Um, and where they indeed then upgrade uh, to the desired uh, level, and then you get for another 10 years the green light. And in principle, that would be at infinitum. But of course, the reason why I'm saying in Belgium 2003, that's when they voted to phase out law. And there they've put into the law 40 years. Okay. But in France, in principle, it's still that same principle. So the original um, license lifetime is not an a priori, uh, a priori reason to shut down because you can get prolongation like in the United States. My conclusion is that the only real lifetime is the economic lifetime. Now, these refurbishments that I talked about, these replacements, they cost money. And when they're too expensive, then the operator or the owner, they will just close their shop. They will say it's too expensive, sorry. But maybe there are new safety rules that cannot be met cheaply, or perhaps there are irreparable flaws uh, and they're too expensive to deal with. Uh, or the refurbishment for load following are too expensive. Now, these circumstances also depend on the uh, market change, uh, electricity market changes. For instance, in the United States, that's the competition with shale gas fired combined cycles, eh, because the competition became much more fiercely. Okay. And that's where indeed, and sometimes operators said, okay, it doesn't make sense to ask for prolongation because we are not competitive anyway. And uh, the coming years, there is no longer automatic uh, base load operation, but reduced capacity factors. That's what will happen. And so the economics will play a role there. So the economic lifetime is the determining factor and actually the only real lifetime. Except the all overruling lifetime is the political lifetime. Hmm. Regardless of democracies or autocracies, politics has the last word. And whether you like it or not, we have to accept it. Okay, now in democracy, you could say many things, but that's maybe the price that we have to pay for dem democracy. It is what it is. Say they have the last word, whatever I said before. But of course, the politics can change. You may have one coalition and then after is another coalition and there, there we have many examples, even in Germany, they change their mind from time to time, might be other, other circumstances, but whatever the situation, when politics get involved, uncertainty is created. Also, if they switch their, 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 their viewpoint, because private investors, okay, they don't like that uncertainty and then they ruin basically the investment climate. There's a typical example in Belgium, in, that was before the law was actually voted, it was 2001, 2002, that the journalist asked the then uh, Minister for Energy, Deleuze, yeah, I'm a Mr. Minister, but uh, uh, after this coalition with the Green Party, because that was with the Green Party, there might come another coalition and they might change the, the law. That's sure, he said, that's maybe, but don't forget that afterwards, maybe a few years down the line, then the Greens will come back and they will reinstate the law. Whatever it is, he says, there will be instability, instability in the market, in the investment climate, and so nuclear will suffer from that. I think he's right, or he was right. There are examples, Germany, Belgium, Sweden, they also changed their mind a few times, but the question then that you have to ask in all honesty in the future is which private investor is still going to invest in the future, at least certainly in the big ones. Okay, so then, after having said that, uh, what, is the long what is the lifetime? So for me, the only, there are basically two important lifetimes. That's the, the, the economic lifetime and the political lifetime, okay? Where the political lifetime is the one that eventually decides. Uh, what is now the levelized cost of electricity for LTO? 
Okay. Now, if you do the computations, these are the results. And the left hand side you see there, although it seems like it's a lot of money that you have to invest now, and it is true, but in principle, you um, compared to the cost of a new power plant, it's, it's much, much smaller. So the best buy that you can do is do the refurbishment, but do them in time. So start early enough to do the studies, to do the refurbishments. Okay, not to like as, uh, just like Belgium and win till the very last moment, et cetera. And this, no, you have to do that in time. So that's indeed and what you, what you can have there. There's an interesting picture there on the right-hand side. I won't go into detail, but you can have a look at that. Uh, that indeed at some moment, the uh, performance level can even go up if you do it uh, properly over the years. So economically, it would make sense. This is what uh, the um, document on the left-hand side there says. Um, I'm not. I'm only going to read the first thing. And so, extended nuclear plants' lifetimes is an indispensable part of a cost-effective path to net zero by 2050. That's what they argue. What they explain. What they say. Um, now, this is being questioned uh, clearly. I have actually added two slides here to. Um, to tease Ronnie a bit because he sometimes uh, follows these folks on uh, on, on Twitter, etc. So Michael Liebreich, uh, that's on the reaction to the German phase out madness, and then Fatih Birol, who on uh, your active also say, well, countries will have to think again. Um, now I think what he meant here: these are the countries where they uh, force nuclear premature nuclear uh, closure. But on the other hand, in principle, uh, as you have already read between the lines, uh, governments should stay out of this thing. But okay, if they do, that's what it is. However, and that's what you always have seen, we will see in, in this discussion that we're doing, we will say something and then afterwards we always say, well, this was on the one hand, but on the other hand now. Eh? Now nuclear and LTO is valuable. I'm convinced of that but it's not a silver bullet. Now, nuclear plants are fine or may be fine for sec uh, security of energy supply if they are available to run. That's a typical example of Belgium. It's between 2011 and 2019. So we had an installed capacity of 6,000 megawatts. It looks more like, if you look at that from a distance, it looks more a little bit like the uh, chronological behavior of an uh, offshore wind power, uh, wind power plant. <laughs> we had lots of difficulties with flaws, with uh, maintenance problems. At some moment, uh, there you see that there was only 1,000 megawatt. So it was in uh, December of 2018. There was only 1,000 megawatt that was available. Now, at this moment, they're still doing very well. And that's what I included there that you see there. That's the capacity factor of the electricity production. You see the last few years were not very well. But then in 2019, 2020, they were indeed then very, very well. In the meantime, two plants have been shut down. <clears throat> France, a very, very bad example the last few years. Okay, this is then what you see. The regular output in France is of the order of over... 400 uh, terawatt hours. Look what they have been doing in 2020, 21, and 22. And uh, indeed, many of their plants, it was a bit of post COVID thing. On the other hand, they had stretch corrosion cracking that they found some problems. And then the regulator said, okay, next time that you do a, a reloading, you have to do testing, you have to do inspections, some new things were discovered, blah, 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 whatever. There are lots of things to explain that. But the point is, they weren't available. Now, that's something that is also a touchy thing. At some moment, the Europeans were laughing with the Americans uh, that the Americans, they don't, didn't have very much standardized nuclear power plants, which meant that they were all a little bit first of a kind. Sometimes it took too long to, to build them. It's true. And when the Europeans said, yeah, but we standardize our plants. Now, standardization is very well, but if you have a generic problem, you have to shut down all of them. Europeans are French. Well, some, some Europeans, some other Europeans as well. Uh, the Canadians have had a similar problem. Uh, the Japanese have had a problem, but in this case, it was the French. That's, that's true. So just as an example, this is what the French, you see there on the right-hand side, on the top, uh, that they've been doing worse and worse. 
Um, now, uh, the reason why the capacity factors in France are relatively moderate or small compared to uh, other countries, that's because they have so much nuclear. And of course, then in December, they can't use all their power plants. So they have to shut down some of their power plants. That's, that's the price they have to pay for that. Sometimes in the weekends as well. Uh, then on the left-hand side, you see there an interesting thing. Uh, the dotted lines, they're in, in, in light gray and, and a little bit black. These were the projections that were made by EDF on what they thought that their future capacity was going to be. They had to revise it several, several. So they're not doing it very well at this moment. The United States, they have been, since the uh, liberalization, they've been doing quite well. Uh, if you can see, they're on the right-hand side pictures. So they're very high up there. Uh, and Finland seems to be uh, the world leader. They are the best in class. Their power plants are running very well. Okay. That's the availability. Still another picture. I'm not going to go in detail, but you see there are three countries, uh, Finland, US, and China doing very well. And France, UK, and Korea, not all that great. That's long-term operation. So there's lots of ifs and buts and maybe and yes and no and... Okay, how about new build? That's a completely different thing. So the first thing you have to understand is you have existing plans. Does it make sense to shut them down prematurely for another reason than economics? I would say no. Well, if it is for safety, sure, then you have to do it yesterday, okay? But otherwise I would say no. And then we will have to see on what, what, what happens. Uh, if there's a political decision, yeah, okay, you can agree, disagree with it, make a lot of noise and whether it's wise to do that now in Germany, I would say no, but okay, whatever. I'm not German. I don't have anything to say about that. New build, that's a completely different thing. That is at this moment with knowing what is going to come, what do you think you want to, to build now? Now, I'm now going to reiterate a little bit what Ronnie is doing. Now, first of all, you have to define what your objective is, your long-term objective. Now, for me, that's pretty clear. That's decarbonization by mid-century. That's what we have to do. Uh, you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want to plead for X percentage of nuclear, for X percentage of renewables. No, you want to decarbonize, and that in the best economic way. So then you have that trilemma that says, yeah, it has to be clean. It has to be clean, but also assured energy provision and affordable, okay? It's a trilemma, which actually gives you a little bit the idea. It's easy to do two, but maybe not three. So this shows a little bit, yeah, we should try to do them all together and optimize, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing is that after February 24th, if you really look at it, what happened, although that was not the intention of Putin, but that's basically what it's going to do. We have seen a massive acceleration in the build out of renewables in Europe, mainly to get out of gas. And this is actually an interesting thing. When I saw this book many years ago, I saw, well, this really explains, eh? I come from a Catholic university, the Holy Trinity, which is ununderstandable, but here it explains it. This basically, it's exactly the same. It just depends on what way you look at it. Eh? If you look at that little wooden, uh, thing there, it depends on how you look at it and how you project it, right? So if you really do that again, then you see, aha, that's energy security, that's green, and that's the budget, that's the economics, and that's all in the societal context. So it's basically no longer uh, a trilemma, it's actually a trinity, it's basically all moving in the same direction. Okay, now, this, what I'm going to say now, and that was also implicit in what Ronnie said, um, the results over the next 10, 20, 30 years will depend on the geography and the meteorology of certain countries. For instance, also uh, in Europe, it's pretty clear uh, for countries coming close to the coast, they can profit from offshore. Those much, much farther inland, Poland, whatever, they, they, they can. So that they're a different thing. Then it's a different game in the south versus the north, etc. Uh, will be completely different. And country policies, whatever they are. We might disagree with them, but countries sometimes can strange certain decisions. We have to expect um, further reductions of cost of PV, wind, and batteries, even in a fragmented non-global world with technological strategic autonomy, right? 
Uh, and I think we have to recognize that it will, for a, a while, will become more costly because all these uh, minerals and rare earths, we have basically outsourced that to the, to the Chinese. The mining and all the dirty work was for them. Now we want to do that ourselves. It will become more expensive. Um, if you want to do our own manufacturing, it will, for a while, be more expensive. But most observers say it probably will continue to go down afterwards. Whatever. I, I'm also convinced that over the next 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to push more and more and more renewables into the system. We will be having we're dealing with huge installed uh, variable renewable energy capacities. And we go towards increased electrification. Now, this is what we engineers like to do. We say, yeah, we can deal with that. And we have all these so-called flexibility options eh? and that will evolve over the next so many years. Flexible thermal generation in order to do then the, the load following uh, that will then be combined cycle gas turbines or open cycle gas turbines. But in the future, will we have to be with carbon capture and storage or it will be with biogas. Then it's by definition uh, neutral. Electrical transmission is another thing. Uh, active demand response or active demand participation and then sector coupling, meaning transportation will also become electrified. Industry will become more electrified and they might also then change the load depending on the price signals, for instance, and energy storage. Now, I should say, and I yesterday looked at my slides again and I corrected them, but I forgot to send them uh, later then. For me, the on a system basis, the cheapest is transmission. If we invest, if we have the courage and we invest in sufficient transmission to balance the different parts of the uh, meteorological circumstances, I'm not saying that transmission as such immediately will be cheap. It will have a certain price. But if you look at the overall system cost, if we don't do the transmission, and here I'm very much worried, and not only, I think my colleague would say on the, would be on the same footing. It's the permitting, the licensing, and people are protesting against everything in these days. If we don't get the transmission lines that we need, the overall system cost will be much more expensive than it should be. Okay. So there we have to be realistic. The dream that we have as engineers will not always be satisfied. We have to be living in the real world, and then we will come and to the lawyers where indeed then uh, if people go to court, et cetera, and appeal and oh, anyway. Now, if you then think of realistic constraints, okay, and by that I mean and permitting, licensing and banana, eh, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Eh, it's the same as uh, NIMBY or NIMTO, eh, it's the same type of story. The long-term, Variable renewable share in different countries will vary from, depending on the situation, 70 to 90%, something like that. I think even the renewable aficionados have realized that 100% will be very, very difficult. But okay, whatever. Okay, we'll, we'll have to see, but it will be different certainly in different countries. A typical example is the United States. They have so many resources over the whole country. If they would have the courage to build a transmission line that covers the whole country, they would almost have no problems whatsoever. They could go to 100%. But the fight that is going on there between the different states, it's incredible. It's, 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 it's well, hopeless. So it will never happen. <laughs> Not in my lifetime. Now, um, because of the long-term storage, and that's then the so-called um, cold doldrums in certain things, or storms that you may have in certain parts of the world, um, people think that there is a gap filling technology needed, and that could be um, combined cycle gas turbines with CCS or hydrogen or nuclear power plants or geothermal. So these are the technologies that are on the line. When I say or, I'm not saying it's exclusive. It may be and or, but some countries will exclude certain certain. Roads. For instance, the Germans, if you just look at that, the way Germany seems to be going at this moment, they say no nuclear, geothermal, we don't know. And that's why they bet so hard on the hydrogen at this moment. That's a little bit what is happening. Um, so the future of nuclear will largely depend on the investment cost. 
And that's the whole thing that the nuclear folks will have to do. They will have to make sure that their uh, investment cost is low enough, otherwise they won't play. Uh, and the realistic contribution of uh, nuclear share in the future, depending on the above, will be, depending on the countries, 10, 20, 30%, whatever. Uh, some countries will try to push farther, I don't know, uh, but that's the order of magnitude. So 10, 20%, that's, I think, realistic. Um, this is about res resilience and long-term effects. Uh, you may have a look at that if you want to. Um, this is something I would like to quote because it summarizes very well. That comes from MIT, an MIT report. And I'm going to read it together with you. While the US nuclear industry remains exceptionally proficient at operating the existing fleet of power plants. Okay, I've, I've shown you that. Its handling of complex nuclear construction projects has been abysmal, as exemplified by the mismanagement of component replacement projects, blah, 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 and then also in the new plants in Vautel and VC Summer. They've experienced soar, uh, soaring costs and lengthy scheduled delays. In the case of Vautel and VC Summer, costs doubled and construction time increased by more than three years causing the reactor supplier Westinghouse to declare bankruptcy. And the VZ summer project was ultimately abandoned. So the United States, they have forgotten how to build power plants. And they continue, well, these new power plant construction uh, projects by French reactor supplier Areva and EDF, Ocleotto and Flamanville, <laughs> and Hinkley Point C have suffered similar severe cost escalations and delays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the bottom, they say the only ones who seem to be doing fine is South Korea, China, and Russia. Also in the Middle East, that's in the Emirates where the Koreans are building, they're doing reasonably well. But it's clear that for the time being, the Western world, if I may say so, the US and Europe, they have forgotten how to build the problems. And it's up to them to make sure that they get their cost, get, and they get their costs down. This gives you an example of some recent uh, in uh, horizontal axis, that's the number of years, how that has changed. And the vertical thing, that's the original cost estimate and then what it ended up with. And you see there that Plamonville, Votel, uh, 3 and 4, and Okoloto are not the best example there. This is just for your information. You may have a look at it. I'm not going to dwell on it. This is an interesting picture I got from, uh, um, from Twitter. Um, that actually shows what is the uh, construction lifetime of nuclear power plants, those who have been built. And you see that if you're optimistic, you look at the thing there that says about two thirds of the plants look, uh, took less than eight years. But if you look at the long tail there at the, at the top, uh, you have indeed then many plants that took an awful lot of time to, to build. These are some historic plants on the left-hand side, the costs. Okay, and um, that's the overnight construction cost. And on the right-hand side, you see recently completed ones. Uh, the China ones are there. Then you have the United States AP1000, very expensive, the UK EPR, and then the French and the Finnish also quite expensive. If you compare that with the one in yellow, that's the one for the Emirates, okay? And this is something I quote also from MIT uh, lecturer, John Parsons. He says, uh, yeah, in blue, the industry in the US and Western Europe faces an existential crisis. So it's up to them to get their act together or they will fail. This is the information, this is for your information later on. Um, I'm also going to skip this. Uh, these are kind of predictions, but just to make the point that you also have to look not only at the cost, but also at the value that they can deliver. And for that, there is a particular metric that the IEA has been promoting the value adjusted LCOE. Uh, what is the value of a nuclear power plant? Well, uh, if you look at that, uh, the competitiveness of a nuclear power plant is that it can um, produce um, when indeed and the electricity prices are high, that at that time that it can earn quite a bit of money. Um, and uh, that raises then its so-called energy value. And um, okay, I, the rest I can leave for you. I'm just skipping this in the interest of time. 
Um, now, I'll just show you one thing. That's a study. It's a bit, um, there has been some reaction to the study, but that's not important to this thing. It's a study for 2050 Greenfield by the NEA and MIT that has been done. Uh, the only flexibility you have in the system is hydro. It's runoff river, reservoir, and pumped hydro storage. Um, and it's effectively, um, yeah. Um, okay. The constraints is you want to have maximum 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So they say, okay, we want to have a system with very little CO2 production. And they impose then variable renewables into the system from zero to 75%, with a share for PV and for wind. Now the base case is zero, so the base case there is no, that's a reference case to compare with, a, ba uh, a base case uh, at zero percent. Um, and then they have some sen sensitivity within the connections and uh, with and without hydro, okay. But then a special case, and that's very important, they run a special case with reduced investment costs for renewables and also um, storage, okay, relative to nuclear. And these are the uh, things that they have been uh, running, not all that important. Um, we're talking about average costs for investment cost, although they know very well that it's different from different parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera. That's not all that important. What you see with their parameters that they have chosen, with their nuclear costs and this for wind and solar, was that the base case had a particular generation cost that's on the left-hand side. If you push in 10% renewables, 30%, et cetera, it becomes more and more expensive. The base case was mostly nuclear-based, okay? And then after pushing in more renewables, nuclear was put out and it became more costly according to their thing. However, and that's the interest, whether you believe this or not, that's a different thing. You could say it depends on the assumption. But the very interesting thing is that when they took the low cost VRE, so when they lowered the cost of PV by 60% and wind by 33%, renewables entered automatically the system. They didn't have to push it in anymore. So, and then you see that the investment cost, that total system cost became actually about the same as the base case. The moral to this story is if nuclear is cheap, it can be part of the system. If nuclear is too expensive, then it will be all renewables that will be in the system. So when nuclear, it's up to nuclear to make sure that they are in the system or not. If they're too expensive, it won't play. That's the moral to the story. Okay, you may read this a little bit. Uh, it effectively says, and these are the cost aspects, that's also IA. They say that nuclear construction will have to fall sharply. If you assume the uh, costs that I have shown before, that's the net zero um, emission uh, by 2050 that the uh, IEA has made, then nuclear plays a complementary role. Okay, just at 10, 20%, something like that. If they want to compete directly with PV and wind power, they will have to lower their cost dramatically. Otherwise, it won't fly. Okay. Here you see that even for heat, and if you see that on the right-hand side, uh, nuclear is on the left-hand side, okay, that's for cogeneration uh, with a variation depending on the situation. But if you compare that to the extreme right-hand side, the light blue things that's heat pumps, you see that nuclear for heat will also have a hard time to compete with that. Now, there are some suggestions. The nuclear field, they know what they're doing. Okay, there's a paper here that explains on how they can clean up the whole thing and make sure that they can get the costs down. The only thing is, it's easy to write that on paper, but to do it in practice, that's a different thing. Okay. SMRs, and I'm almost finished. Yeah, because we only have 10 minutes more. So mm -hmm. if you want to look a little bit. SMRs, I don't have much to say about that. I would say if you want to know more about it, look at that. There are 83 different designs, six types, and they put these days everything under that same envelope, SMRs. They're water-cooled. Uh, they're basically big plants that they have scaled down, and they also call them SMR. 
all the way up to the, the bottom. These are the, the micro reactors. Uh, I would say let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, but the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Okay. The two meanings, and that's important that you understand that. The first thing is that you have many identical reactor units and that you're going to site them next to each other. A little bit like I tried to show there with a bad example. You have many of them just next to each other, smaller ones. Okay. And then you can turn on or shut down uh, some of them. And that might be different. And, and, and extreme example is uh, reactors fitting in a container and you put containers somewhere. The other thing that is that you the modular is defined that you have look at one reactor, but you're going to look at major parts of the reactor that you're going to build in the that you're going to build in the workshop, not on site. Okay, which means that you're going to assemble them on the site a little bit like uh, IKEA or Lego, click them in. Uh, much much less on site. Okay. Uh, they may provide an interesting technology. Uh, some support R and D is warranted, um, but I would say um, at the end, uh, and there's the last line there. When companies start using their own money, then it looks interesting. If they have to run only on subsidies, that doesn't mean usually very much. You need standardization, etc., and a stable investment. But it's up to the nuclear fission community to prove that they can make it work. I have a similar type of thing, a few slides on nuclear fusion, but I won't deal with them. Okay. But the moral to the story of fusion is basically the same as this. Okay. As SMRs, it's, um, uh, it will be up to the fusion community to prove that they can make it. Uh, and uh, if they don't, well, it won't work. That's it. And maybe one final thing, yeah, yeah, uh, that's the conclusion. What I simply did, I took this document and this is the executive summary. I just took the bold things every time of these things. Uh, is there a new down for energy? They're uh, achieving uh, zero will be harder without nuclear, they claim, but nuclear has to be up to its game and order to play its part, especially the costs have to come down. Okay, markets have to account also for the added value that is given. And finally, the momentum behind small may be building. This is my overall takeaway. It's the economy stupid. Indeed, the determining factor will be cost. In turn, assisted by technical flexibility and the characteristics, which is then the value. And uh, it's the cost value balance that will determine the future of nuclear. That's what I wanted to say. Peace. Sorry that I took so long. No, no, thank you very much. That was very... Very rich in insight, so you know I let you go because we we want to learn about this, and it's a complex reality. And you know, oftentimes, as you were, both of you are saying, you read the press and you feel the journalists are making a pretty bad job at uh, summarizing the the issues. And or you know, we the researchers would like to understand a little more of the complexity over what you find in journals. Um, you know, maybe we can get reactions from the room uh, in person before and, and then go online and then Ronnie can chime in. Um, Giacomo Ilaia, yeah. Thank you, it was very, very interesting. I learned a lot. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, and I mean, probably what we understood is that indeed there will be a future for nuclear and the future energy system. Of course, this is something that uh, uh, is probably now to be taken for granted. And also there is no doubt, I think that the determining factor will be the cost. Um, but I was wondering um, regarding another important element because uh, Professor, you correctly underlined the energy trilemma. So it's not only about cost, it's also about the sustainability value. So for nuclear, uh, I was wondering to what extent the problem of waste is taken into account if it is uh, included as an externality in this cost, um, and also whether there has been some uh, progress, because I heard that the technology has advanced also regarding waste. I'm not definitely not up to date on that. Uh, so can you elaborate a little bit more on this in the context of the future vision for the system? Do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> uh, well, if you look at the externalities, if the, if the external costs, even for uh, waste, that's minimal if you compare that to uh, if you compute that per uh, per megawatt hour uh, that that's minimal but you have to assume that 
the companies also have done their job and the, the governments have also overseen that, that for the waste, that the uh, waste that was produced over the years, that they had set up a fund similarly for decommissioning so that indeed, and at this moment when, the, when they stop the nuclear power plants and when they have to deal with the waste, that the money would be there. Okay, now what is lacking, I, I'm convinced that the technical solution, they exist. If you really want to deal with uh, an unreliable manner with high level waste, uh, the very dangerous one, which has a very small, small uh, volume, um, then um, I would say vitrify it. So make that in that, that kind of typical uh, black glass and, and put it 200, 400 meters underground geological and it won't come out. Uh, that is uh, that, that, that's for sure. But a country will have to make a decision and then you can move on. What is happening in many countries is that they don't take a decision and it's always push forward and the, they lack the courage to decide and then they say there is no solution. That's not true. Now, just to give you an example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop because otherwise I will have to do a complete new lecture, but just to talk about the volumes of nuclear waste. Right? No. Take Belgium as a country. We are 10, 11, 11 million. Let's say over the years it was 10 million, and now 11 million. Half of our electricity has been produced by nuclear, right? And let's suppose 40 years of operation time. Now, the amount of waste, low-level waste and high-level waste. Now, low-level waste, that is also the, the clothing, the, 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 the wipes, etc., that you have used uh, in hospitals, also for power plants, from filters, etc. Uh, and then the high-level waste, which is that comes out of the fuel after the reactor. It's 70,000 cubic meters. I can give you the details if you want to. Uh, I, I, I lecture on that. 70,000 cubic meters. Now, what is 70,000 cubic meters? I'm not, he's more a football fan than I am, but a, a football field is 70 meters by 100 meters, right? And if you take a little bit of space, okay? That's already 70 by the 7,000, 10 meters high. So all the nuclear waste from Belgium, from having produced from 40 years, half of the electricity fits in a big hall of a football field, 10 meters high. If you then only look at the, the waste, the, the really heavy waste, the, 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 uh, the high level waste, that's 7,000 cubic meters. So it's a factor of 10 less, okay? So if we as a society cannot manage that, then I don't know what we do. If, you, if I compare that with the amount of toxicity that is of, high level toxic waste, toxic waste that we produce in industry, it's only a factor of 100 less. Now, I'm not saying that because other people are dirty that you can also be dirty, no, no. I'm just saying if we as a society can deal with chemical waste, why can't we deal with nuclear waste? It's being considered as a, as a myth. For me, it's not. There are technical solutions, but we just have to do it. Um, and you have to make a big distinction between low level waste High level waste, now in Belgium, they have now a decision that for low level waste, they're going to put that in bankers. Okay, I have said in my lectures, and I still say that here, as far as I'm concerned, they may put that in my yard and I don't have to mow the glass myself, uh, the, the grass myself, okay? I wouldn't actually mind that. The, the way that they uh, are setting up these things, but well, that's for three or 400 years, I, I don't see any problem whatsoever. But the high level waste, they're still studying, they're still yes, no. Um, now, some countries, and that's the two things that you have, some countries go for reprocessing, which means that they take out then the uranium and they separate the uranium and plutonium, and then they keep them the waste separately. Other countries, they say no, everything that comes out of the, of the reactor, that's the spent fuel, is considered to be waste. Okay, and there is a big, there's a dis distinction between those things, but that's a choice of a country. Now, I don't see a technical problem. And also, if you if you look at the scientific literature, the external costs, it's it, it's very small. Now, there are these ideas that there is a possibility, because it's still sensitive in the public and the political world, whether whatever, whatever uh, engineers explain, to reduce that thing, and that is a hope that in some of the designs of SMR, 
that it might take care of its own waste. And that's then with another type of reactor that's with fast neutrons that it might be dealing with. But we'll have to wait and see whether it will fly. In Belgium, there is an example in the nuclear research station uh, center, um, that's Mira, uh, that actually would be designed to burn, uh, but not burn, but to, um, that, that's a bad word, uh, if you're not an expert, uh, to transmute, to change, uh, to break down the nuclear waste from long, long term to short uh, term uh, nuclear waste. But I don't. I don't see. If you, if I look at the literature, I, I don't see the problem. Yeah. So really, thanks a lot. That was really uh, illuminating. Uh, we learned a lot from from what you, uh, the two of you, told us today. Um, so it's related to this uh, question on on waste. Uh, uh, partly related because um, um, we have learned the other lecture of how. Uh, uh, geopolitics of energy is playing a role uh, nowadays quite dramatically, you know, uh, given what we've seen uh, uh, in Europe and uh, uh, the situation. Now, um, uh, I was thinking, what is your opinion? I would, uh, would be really interested to know what uh, your opinion in terms of how you think uh, uh, nuclear energy could help us somehow um, Giving more stability uh, in in uh, in the you know uh, generation of uh, energy and uh, in, as a consequence as a, in terms of uh, uh, geopolitics and uh, so I have the impression that uh, if I if I look at what for example Italy is doing uh, nowadays to substitute the source of uh, gas uh, you know. Uh, it's uh, generate is uh, looking for alternatives to the Russian gas. I'm asking myself to what extent the discussion on energy and, uh, in particular, nuclear energy, was uh, involved in this idea of having um, more stable geopolitics of energy. Uh, to what extent, in your opinion, this was a, a key element and a relevant element for uh, uh, for the discussion on nuclear energy. Uh, let's be correct in the amount of energy that we're talking about. Okay. Even if the models as we use it, and William said also at the end, nuclear can contribute 10 to 20% to the, the overall thing. Will this be the most critical point? I don't think so. The most critical point is that we get an the first thing to do is that we get our act together on the renewable part, which we don't. And as William said, the most critical part that we have to do is to get the grids correctly. And I don't know whether you have read The Economist of last week. There is the middle pages are dedicated to hug grids, no trees. So we need those grids to have the next 10 years will be grids, grids, grids to have electricity there. And nuclear can, can never do a lot except for what it has now. To do something in the first 10 years, does that mean that we don't have to look at nuclear? I think that William clearly showed you that it's part, that it can be part of the game. I also showed you that. But first, the, the, the reaction now to what, what's happening now can never come from nuclear in the time horizon that we need that reaction. And that's why the, the deployment of, of renewables has to be accelerated as much as possible. And electricity has to be used as electricity. And not the whole thing about uh, using green power electricity here for producing hydrogen. This will not help us. So the electrical, the elect strategically, electricity is deeply to go from renewables now. Right. It's also, sorry to, to jump in, it's also interesting that you are seeing uh, uh, transmission, you also mentioned transmission as an important, very important element, also in terms of uh, as a stabilizer of uh, tensions that we are observing nowadays. If we had more grids, probably we had much less problem that we are observing nowadays. Uh, if I may add to that, um, when you 
just your, your, your former question. I think it's important to make a distinction between existing plans and new plans. We may disagree, the two of us, but okay, fine. Uh, that, that's what the academic life is about. I don't think it's wise to now, given the situation, to shut down safe plants prematurely. I think what the Germans are doing, I think, is, is wrong. What in Belgium is going on, but that's a long history. It's not a good signal. Spain, I heard, I read yesterday, are also going to shut down these things. I think for the next five to 10 years, I would still say keep that nuclear online because we do have a natural gas problem at this moment. Until we have our act together, until that stabilizes, we still have to see what is going to happen now with the shale gas in the US because uh, if you look at the things, it says it's very productive at this moment, but the the, the wells there actually take take um, they, they become more depleted. The US reaction for new production of shale gas is relatively moderate, lower than expected to some extent. But okay, you know that uh, as well as I do. Um, so that's the question of for the short term. The reaction that we're seeing for the in many countries of now pushing for nuclear for new build for the security problem, nuclear will become too late anyway for that thing. And I do agree with everything that is in on, on the books now or that we can see is we have to get look. We have chosen a, a path and, and the costs have come down for wind and solar and batteries. We will be flooded by variable renewables. So we have to get that system to work. And the best way to get the system to work is because we will be dealing with massive overcapacities, get our transmission correctly. And then we will see where to plug the holes. And for those holes, you said nuclear will be used that depends on the different countries. I always say may be used, but it depends from country to country. Some will say yes, some will say for whatever reason. Um, but, and then it's up to also the SMRs. They will have to make sure that they deliver in time and on cost if they want to be part of the game. Otherwise, it won't happen. Uh, I think there are many countries, governments that are have that idea of nuclear will save us, up to a certain extent, it might help. Now, the lesson that we have to learn, and you mentioned Italy and Germany is the same thing. The good lesson from what Putin has done is that it's a reminder, don't put all your eggs in the same basket. It's that old wisdom. Diversify, diversify, and do the same for the future. And as far as I'm concerned, let nuclear be part of that thing. Now, what the French are doing, I'm actually enjoying this thing as an academic to look at what Germany is doing and what France is going to be doing. France wants to prove that they can make a lot of nuclear and renewables together. The Germans want to do everything without any nuclear and how this is going to play. Then the British are going to do something, still something different, and we are squeezed in between. <laughs> what the Italians are going to do, we don't know yet, but uh, but it's, it's interesting to, to, to watch these things. Uh, but I think the first thing that they should learn now is Make sure that uh, diversification, that's a very important thing. Uh, as far as contracts are concerned, and your friends of the few, uh, of your current friends or neighbors might not be your best friends in the future. Let's also be honest there. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, nobody predicted Brexit. Um, yeah. Uh, we're living in a relatively politically unstable European Union at this moment. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but you're doing investments for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Um, so make sure that you do your homework, diversify. Um, also, as far as technologies are concerned, and I think part of the of the solution are grids. Um, yeah. It, first of all, I'm surprised that you're saying that we may be having different minds on keeping the existing nuclear open. I don't care. It's, it's for me. It's a political decision, and what I would like to stress is that the nuclear. If you look at the three power plants which are closed this weekend in Germany, it's very non-understandable given the gas crisis. But given the overall demand in Europe, it's a rickle. Okay, so it's 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 not the how should I say it will not turn out or turn on the lights. Okay, but it's 
It's a, it's a debate, and the pro nucleus will say, "See how stupid it is," and the pro renewables just will say, "See how see how few it is in the whole thing." It's it's a non debate for me. If I look if I look at the outages in France at the moment, which are not debated, well, are debated, but are not debated in the press. That's something which surprises me a lot. But transmission is so important and there is so this so important in a european way and what we are missing is that european view of transmission we have from the commission a 10-year development plan i showed you the, the figures a 10-year development plan that's a laugh okay that's a few lines across a border this is not bringing what we need we need to get out that 300 gigawatt of offshore wind from the North Sea into land. We need to get from, for Belgium, we end up with 60 or 70 gigawatt of PV on the roofs. We need to get those grids ready for the future. And maybe there's also European view that we have to look at. If we look at where things are happening, why would there not be an incentive if you're planning nuclear? I would never put a nuclear plant in Belgium or Holland. That's totally nuts. There is so much flooding of offshore wind there that it will never have a business case over there. Let's also look geographically where to put them. If you put that nuclear plant, if it's going to work in, in Czechia, that's far more reasonable to have that type of sustainable power plant there. Because to my knowledge, and I hope that climate doesn't change that much, that Czechia is going to have a coast. So we, we, we need to diversify on the European scale on these sustainable resources. And I don't see that happening. I see Holland promoting nuclear. And I say to myself, they don't know what to do with their, what they're going to have on offshore wind. Why would they add to that nuclear power? This is just my engineering feeling. Stupid. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting because, um, yeah, the, I mean, it seems to me the politics are just so complicated. Uh, you know, nuclear appeals to, uh, the long history of national excellence in some countries. So there's this sort of romantic vision of the past where I'm French Belgian. So I was growing up in an environment in which the nuclear was sort of, you know, big success story of mm -hmm. French engineering excellence. So, you know, now it comes that, so all that stuff is coming back with that flavor on the, in the discussion and it seems what we hear from both of you in a way is we have a lot of evidence of requirements and challenges and the science say this, the economics say this, but then of course, you know, the political environment is just so volatile that, you know, it's more, yeah, evidence is not really regarded on, on its own terms and, and there's all this fluctuation. I, I had two questions, if you allow me. So one is China, I mean, is China using nuclear as a baseload model under a baseload model or under a load following model? And the second question is, um, um, who's, so you're making this difference, you say the grid, the grid, the grid transmission, more than maybe, you know, maybe more than generation. Um, why, I mean, why is the investment going into generation, not transmission? So, because it seems, I, maybe I'm, there's something I'm missing here in the understanding, but you're saying transmission investment is laughable. It's too low. So is, are we saying that we, have, we don't have really a, a problem of investment in generation? We have a problem of investment in transmission and why that? Why the discrepancy? May, may, I can point you to, I will give a talk on the oops, 11th of May in, in, in Bergen, but that's, and, and the, the, the title of the talk is Building Wind Turbines May Be the Easiest Part. Okay? It, and the talk will be you can build easy 
offshore wind. Wind turbines, it's not going to be much opposition, cost you a bit of money. There's no NIMBY, the fishes don't write uh, any legislation against it. But to get it where it needs to be, that's going to be the difficult part. The grid in the North Sea, who is going to be the regulator, who is going to be able to invest? There is no TSO in the North Sea. And then you get the, the TSOs, the TSOs which are on the coast. How can you, if there's not a European view, how can you push the Belgium TSO to build a high voltage line across Belgium to supply Germany without any connection in Belgium? So this is the, the real policy that we need. And also, if you go to nuclear, if, and William didn't, didn't go to the, into that thing, but if, you, if we once would have fusion, would have fusion, then we're talking about plants of William, correct me, four, five, to 10 gigawatt at one point. No? They're small, but the, the, the nuclear also needs a grid. So, and also you need a distribution grid to get that low level. And I would like to more and more object to the term renewable energy. I would like to talk about PV, wind, etc., because it seems we don't want to give the impression to put all the eggs in one basket and then people say gas, coal, renewables, and nuclear. Nuclear is also a very broad thing. You have hydro is nuclear. You have wind, offshore, onshore wind, PV. There are three to four eggs in the basket. It's renewable. It's not one egg in that basket. They are totally different in, in how they behave. If I may add a few things to that. Um, when we stress transmission, that is because we assume that the renewable investment in Europe will happen. Right. Okay, but it will happen in different parts of Europe according to the meteorological circumstance. And what we have in mind is that the better your transmission grid is, the fewer holes you will have to plug for the rest because you can transmit them when it's sunny or when there's wind, we can exchange from one part to the other. And that's optimization of the whole thing. If you have a good grid, then you can say, okay, what else do we need? And then maybe nuclear, natural gas with CCS, hydrogen might be part of the picture. That's why we stress thing. If you don't have transmission, then we will have many more uh, generation needed. Instead of that, it will be more expensive. That's what we, we have in mind. Now, on China. Can, can I just ask you, what is the time frame of uh, uh, building this transmission line from uh, North Sea to, let's say, Italy uh, to transmit this uh, 300 gigawatt? Engineering wise, two to three years, permit wise. Put a zero behind it. <laughs> that's the problem. It's 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 the licensing that will be the problem. That is, uh, and that's why we have to keep in mind that other things might come out, depending on country to country, which is not the logical way to do. But uh, and it will be more expensive then. Now on on China. Um, now China at this moment uh, runs still many of the plants in baseload. The reason is that um, electricity is still growing. Electricity demand is still growing in China. So demand is growing. In certain locations, however, they will have to do load following. Okay, and they will have to uh, adapt to the to, to, to the grid because uh, or or they, uh, but of course, everything is state state owned there. I'll give you an example. Originally, and that's that's a little bit deviating from the thing. But originally, they had many, many coal fire, but they still have many coal fire plants. But in the northwest, uh, northeastern part, they had, in order to make them more environmentally friendly, their coal fire plants were also for cogeneration. They also produced heat for district heating. Now, what they then had in the winter, very cold winter, they needed the heat for the district heating, so they had to keep their coal fire plants running. And they shut down their wind turbines. So they could deal massive amounts of wind turbines. Now they're actually reorganizing this thing, and now they're actually making nuclear also sometimes in cogeneration. So they might run into the same problems. Now, I always say, I take a bit of a distance, the Chinese, they will do everything. Hmm. 
They will do everything. Massive renew, many, massive, uh, massive PV, massive wind, onshore, maybe offshore. Uh, they will say nuclear. They will call for the time being. They will do CCS. They will natural. They will do everything. Um, and I think in that sense, that's that's an interesting thing. Now, since you said one thing about being French, um, my reading also about the French is. You're right that in France, nuclear was indeed then, uh, it was kind of an institution itself. It was very good students, et cetera, that they had. It was a whole machinery, if I may say so. Now, at some moment, the politics started to wobble. And that's when, uh, what's his name? But there was, uh, uh, who, who shut down Super Phoenix? Um, no, 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 no. Mitterrand shut down. Then Super Phoenix was done by um, Ali. He, he was prime minister under Chirac. Jospin. Jospin. It was Jospin who said that. Eh? And that's when, indeed, then, um, when France started to say no, yes, no, right. yes. Yeah, and where, indeed, then, also EDF didn't know exactly what was the liberalization. EDF didn't actually know exactly what to do anymore. Uh, they, they probably didn't do the refurbishments in time. So the whole machinery was kind of no longer perfect. And I think that's what they're paying the price for at this moment. I think they're paying now the price for the uh, political instability on the overall system and the organizational thing. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's one of what I think. Uh, Okay. But will I, my my viewpoint is it will be different in different parts of of, of Europe, mm. uh, depending on what the politics will be involved. Um, okay. Chirac was president in '97. Yeah, but but he Chirac was, was Chirac was president in 1997 when the Super Phoenix was shut down. Yeah, but he was president, but he had another prime minister. Yeah, he, he was Chospin. He yeah, had uh, yeah, he come for one year, ten months, and then he had the socialist uh, prime minister. Who I think came up with the platform of shutting down. Yeah, because he was with the Greens. So, why did Chirac choose Chospin? I, I can to, explain that. There was uh, <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you call that? Uh, because the parliament was cohabitation. Uh, cohabitation. Yeah. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we need to close now. I think we need to close now. Uh, I want to thank the people in the room. We didn't give you a lot of um, attention. The, the, the scene was not great to interact with the people online, but I'll check the chats for the questions and um, I'll see with our colleagues if if they can provide comments and I'll write down the answers uh, uh, myself. So I want to thank uh, the two speakers uh, today for their very good and deep uh, exposition of the problems we're facing here. I think we, re I mean, I really learned personally a lot, a whole lot. I took some notes. And, uh, and so I want really to thank you heartfully for uh, taking the time to, to run us through these very complex issues in a very clear way. So thanks a lot. And I'm sure there'll be other interactions with the FSR in the future. Thanks also to the colleagues from the FSR for showing up and, uh, and Giacomo, the Dean of Research, um, and to be with us. So a, a little applause or a big applause. Uh, bedankt, as we say in Dutch. And uh, yeah, uh, other people can take it from there. Bye, everyone in the room. It was our pleasure. Uh, we enjoyed ourselves. Thanks.